Welcome to Hub History, the show where we share our favorite stories from Boston history. This is episode 131, Love Behind Enemy Lines. Hi, I'm Nikki. And I'm Jake. This weekend, your humble hosts are out of town, celebrating a milestone anniversary with a getaway to P-Town. Because we're celebrating love, this week we'll be talking about a romance carried out in revolutionary Boston. Delia Jarvis was from a loyalist family, and Billy Tudor was a fiery patriot. But their love blossomed against the odds, even when they were on opposite sides of the Siege of Boston. Plus, we're trying something new this week. We're going to bring in a guest for a quick interview to tell us about this week's featured historic event. But before we talk about Delia and Billy's romance, we want to take a moment to remind you about our Patreon campaign and thank everyone who's already given. Supporting the show on Patreon for as little as $2 a month helps us offset the cost of producing Hub History. Plus, there are special rewards for you at the $2, $5, and $10 monthly levels, or as we call them, the Amelia Earhart, Lewis Hayden, and Abigail Adams levels. So without any further ado, it's time for this week's Boston Book Club selection and our upcoming historical event. Our pick for the Boston Book Club this week is Bunker Hill, A City, A Siege, A Revolution by Nathaniel Philbrick. Philbrick is the author of a veritable lending library of popular history titles, including books on the wreck of the whale ship Essex, Washington's strategy at Yorktown, the Mayflower Pilgrims, and the Battle of Little Bighorn. We've used his book on Bunker Hill as a source for our episodes on Pope's Night, The Three Burials of Joseph Warren, and practically anything to do with the Revolutionary Era. Here's how Philbrick's website summarizes the book. Boston in 1775 is an island city occupied by British troops after a series of incendiary incidents by patriots who range from sober citizens to thuggish vigilantes. After the Boston Tea Party, British and American soldiers and Massachusetts residents have warily maneuvered around each other until April 19th, when violence finally erupts at Lexington and Concord. In June, however, with the city cut off from supplies by a British blockade and Patriot militia poised in siege, skirmishes give way to outright war in the Battle of Bunker Hill. It would be the bloodiest battle of the Revolution to come, and the point of no return for the rebellious colonists. Philbrick brings a fresh perspective to every aspect of the story. He finds new characters and new facets to familiar ones. The real work of choreographing rebellion falls to a 33-year-old physician named Joseph Warren, who emerges as the -the on-the-ground leader of the Patriot cause and is fated to die at Bunker Hill. Others in the cast include Paul Revere, Warren's fiancé, the poet Mercy Scully, a newly recruited George Washington, the reluctant British combatant General Thomas Gage, and his more bellicose successor William Howe, who leads the three charges at Bunker Hill and presides over the claustrophobic cauldron of a city under siege, as both sides play a nervy game of brickmanship for control. With passion and insight, Philbrook reconstructs the revolutionary landscape, geographic and ideological, in a mesmerizing narrative of the robust, messy, blisteringly real origins of America. Philbrick does exhaustive research, but his books are written for a general audience and easy to read. You're listening to us right now, so you know Boston history. Even if you think you know the story of Bunker Hill, you'll like his book. We'll have a link to buy it in this week's show notes. For our upcoming event this week, we're trying something new. We're featuring a series of events called Crossing Borders that's being presented in May and June by Historic Newton, the Natick Historical Society, the Needham History Center and Museum, and the Wellesley Historical Society. And joining us now to explain what the series is and where it came from is Clara Silverstein from Historic Newton. Clara, I just want to say thanks for making time to talk with us today. Can you start out just by telling us about Historic Newton, what the organization is and and what it does? Historic Newton is the history organization for the city of Newton, Massachusetts. And we run two museums, the Jackson Homestead and the Durant Kenrick House and Grounds. And then we also run many, many public programs. Those include lectures, walking tours. We have our big Newton House tour coming up on May 19th. And we have a lot of educational programs as well. Now, do I have this right? That is, is Historic Newton affiliated with the town government? It is a public-private partnership. 
which <laughs> means that part of our budget does come from the city of Newton. And the city technically owns one of the museums, the Jackson Homestead. And then the private partnership comes in for the Durant Kenrick House and Grounds. And some of our staff is funded by the city, some is funded by the partnership. So there's a lot of back and forth, but for us, it's fairly seamless. We all feel like one organization. It's just that they're two different funding sources. That's neat. I think that's different than a lot of our local uh, historical societies. Right. Uh, we still fundraise a lot, but we also <laughs> do get support from the city government. So in that regard, we're lucky. We'll include a link for fundraising in this week's show notes. <laughs> Good one, Nikki. So to dive right into it, where did this concept of an event structured around the idea of crossing borders come from? There's a group of museum professionals, mostly in the western suburbs, that meets to share ideas and to feel like we have colleagues out there. Because often many of the historical societies are so small, it's one or two people Sometimes it's one paid staff person and the rest volunteers. So we, in those meetings, began to talk and exchange ideas about possibly collaborating on a program. And the four communities actually do share borders. So we began to think of ways that we could talk to people about topics that really do affect the four communities that are collaborating in this series of programs. So it started with conversations, and then we built the content after we decided we wanted to collaborate. I should also mention that very early in the process, the Wellesley Bank Charitable Foundation came in and agreed to support us with funding. So we're very happy that we have a grant from that group. Now, I looked at the press release for your event, and there's a, a phrase that I, I picked up on from that saying that, Borders in the region, municipal and psychological, have shifted over time. What's that referring to? What are the psychological borders that have been shifting over time? You wouldn't think that people are parochial in our, those suburbs. You'd think that people just go from one to another and do their shopping, do their errands, get involved in things. But people do feel a very strong sense of community in each one of these locales. And so that still doesn't mean that there aren't things that we share in common. So I think that's the psychological border that goes along with the physical border. And the school systems are different. The municipal government is different. So there are things that are separate, but then there are a lot of historical events and trends that really don't have these boundaries between the towns and cities. So that's what we were trying to get at with that phrase. It's interesting to think about the psychological borders, because I think there's such a psychological border between Boston and not Boston, and like the pride <laughs> that exists on both sides of that border. And then even within the city, like the neighborhood borders, like it is true that we are a city of neighborhoods and, um, that is sometimes good and sometimes bad as well. It's interesting that that extends out into um, the Newton Wellesley area as well. Right. And then within each community, each community has certain neighborhoods that are sometimes allied and sometimes people feel like, well, in, in Newton, especially, there are many villages and people might think, well, in West Newton, we do things differently than in Chestnut Hill. And then in Chestnut Hill, we do things differently than in Auburndale, and, and people think like that, but it's all part of one municipality. Yeah, it's what the seven villages of Newton, I think, is what the sign says. Newton has 14 different villages. Some are bigger than others, but the community is made up of many different centers, and many of them grew historically. And we still have 14, even though they're part of the same municipality. Yeah, that's unique even in the Boston area. It seems very unique to Newton, that, that village identity. Definitely. It's one of Newton's points of pride. <laughs> so I guess one thing that makes the Crossing Borders series unique is that you're collaborating with all these other historical societies in your area, sort of the Metro West area with Natick, Needham, Wellesley. How did that 
partnership come together? It's, do you work regularly with them or is this just a one-time thing for this uh, series of events or what's happening with that? It's a one-time collaboration for this series of events, but we are hoping that in the future, now that we know each other better and we've worked together, that we can think about doing other events together. The first event in the series we just had this past weekend, and it was a walk between Newton and Wellesley in the Lower Falls area, which also used to be part of Needham. So that pulls in Needham. But the Charles River in this particular part of Newton crosses and defines the border. So we literally crossed the border as we were walking and talking about the history of the neighborhood. So that was a wonderful, very concrete example of collaboration. So we missed the first event in the series, which is unfortunate. But can you tell us what the other events in the Crossing Borders series are? Right. The first event had 77 people on a walking tour. Ooh. So I don't think we needed any more people on that one. It was <laughs> really, it went really well, but um, that, that was certainly a full audience. So the next one coming up is going to be held at the Needham History Center and Museum. And that is talking about suburbanization. It's the forces that shaped the four locales. And we have an urban planner, James O'Connell. He was going to be giving a free lecture. That takes place at 7 p.m. And he has called Boston the national pace setter for suburbanization. And he's talking about transportation, which helped open up the suburbs to commuters, but then also about how they fit into the whole picture of Boston as a metropolitan area. We all know that Boston itself is a very small population, very small land area. But then if you take in the metropolitan area, it's huge. So how do these suburbs, which really did mostly start as commuter suburbs, fit in with the picture of Boston? Yeah, I know we've talked about some of those topics in, I think it was our interview or our episode about uh, Boston's history of annexation, uh, annexing neighboring towns and what towns did and didn't go for that. Uh, Very notably, Brookline didn't, even though it was similarly linked by transit and the municipal services, water, sewerage, stuff like that. So it's interesting to see how some towns like Newton and Natick, the Metro West towns, kept that separate identity, become suburbs, where then other towns like where we live in Hyde Park choose to become a part of the city of Boston, even as late as 1912. There's a book about the um, suburbanization of Brookline as well which we recently featured in a Boston book club selection. Or maybe it was an event. It was an author talk. I'm not sure. It's very interesting because sometimes if you ask a resident of one of these communities where they live, they might say Boston. And they might really think of themselves as Boston residents, and they just happen to sleep in whatever community they're in. And yet other people are very much tied to the community where they live, and they're very involved in the community. So you really get a mix of the people who treat it as bedroom community, and then the people who really think of it as their own domicile and their own town or city that they want to contribute to. The the psychological borders like that also, I think, transcend time in addition to space. Because, you know, I work in the South End, and uh, worked in East Boston as well. And I think in both neighborhoods, you you didn't get to be a Bostonian or a South Ender or an East Bostonian unless you were born there. You really had to inherit the community. And it's it's just so interesting how like territorial Boston is. Right. So and, and I do remember when I moved to Boston, and I've lived here for more than 30 years, I really had to learn all the names of everything. And it was confusing. There were probably 50 names that you need to be conversant with just in the greater metro area of the inner suburbs within Route 95. And then if you want to go out to 495, there's even more. So, And then you have to pronounce them correctly. So right. there's a lot. A there's a big learning curve for the Boston area. But it is the point of pride where people are And also the way that a lot of the suburbs are organized, it is around a village green and a church and a store. And you have that real physical sense of a center 
or the square, as uh, that was another term I needed to learn. So, and, and Newton has that just on a, a mini scale with all the different village centers, because just about all the villages have a very identifiable center. So what's coming up after our look at the, uh, the rise of the suburbs? So the next one is on May 30th at 7 p.m., and that one takes place in Natick. It is organized by the Natick Historical Society. It takes place at the Morse Institute Library, which is right in the center of Natick. And in that one, it's called Women of Natick and Ponkapog, The Untold History of Praying Towns. And this dates back to a minister who had Newton ties. He came to Newton first, and he was converting the Native Americans to Christianity, John Eliot. And the group started in Newton, and then they moved out to Natick. And the people who are giving this program are Native American. It's Kristen Wyman of the Natick. Nipmuc tribe and Elizabeth Solomon of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. They're talking about the history of the praying towns in the 17th century in New England and then how missionary work influenced national Indian policy and continues to perpetuate the myth of Indian extinction today. So, a very interesting look back at that history and what its legacy is. The praying towns really are an untold history, and I think perhaps a topic we need to dig into more on the podcast. Right. It, it's a very interesting history because the Native people who were in Newton accepted John Eliot. They saw signs that, that made them receptive to him in some of the things he said. And John Eliot also did learn the native language and translated the Bible into the native language. So an unintended consequence is that we have this wonderful record of the native language. Uh, but part of the story is very sad. The people had their praying towns and were doing well. But as often happened the settlers wanted their land and didn't want them there. And some of them were sent to one of the Boston Harbor Islands and they did not fare very well when they did that. A lot of them died. So that's, that's a sad part of the history, which needs to be uncovered and understood better as part of the New England history, because this, the praying towns were very celebrated at first as something that was positive for the native people. Of course, at the program, we're going to hear the Native people's perspective on this. Yeah, I know members of the Massachusetts tribe each year, I think in October, hold a uh, a walk and canoe paddle to Deer Island to commemorate the, I guess you'd call it the internment camps they were placed into there where they were decimated or more than decimated. Um, like a fifth, I think, survived that mm -hmm. internment. Right. It, it was a really shameful and sad chapter in the history. So it's important to commemorate that and understand that that was part of the story that we hear about John Eliot almost as a hero, but there was a, a dark side to it as well. Yeah, it's a topic, specifically the praying towns is a topic that we should try to tackle in a little more depth. I know we've discussed Eliot a little bit in the past with Nikki, what was that? Was that the Harvard Indian College episode? Yeah, I been. think so. Okay. But we have not delved into the, the history of the Praying Towns nearly enough. So anybody who would like to learn more should go on May 30th. Is that right? Yes, it's May 30th at 7 p.m. at the Morse Institute Library in Natick. There's a pretty good chance you'll see us there, it sounds like. And then what's the? there's one more uh, event in this series, right? That's right. And one of the things we realized, I mentioned when I talked about the walking tour between Na Newton and Wellesley, that the border of the two towns there is the Charles River. So the Charles River goes through all the communities, all four in this collaboration. And the last talk is Tuesday, June 4th at 7 p.m. And that is at the Durant Kenrick House and Grounds that's one of the historic Newton museums. So that's in Newton. 
and that's also at 7 p.m. And uh, it's a, a woman who spent years researching and exploring the Charles River, Kathleen Rowe, and her talk is called Down by the River, New Takes on Charles River History. So she's going to be showing slides and showing some of the natural beauty, but then talking about the history of the river. The natives called it Quinabaquin. There's a mm. road in Newton with that name right. that, that parallels the Charles River. And it means river that meanders or waterway that meanders. Because if you ever look at a map, the Charles River loops and goes this way and that way. And so there are a lot of historic sites and events that have taken place along its banks in this area. Uh, she's also going to bring us up to the present day and talk about some of the initiatives that have brought the Charles River back to being a waterway that doesn't smell bad, that isn't so polluted. And it's really now considered an exemplary urban waterway for recreation. You can even swim in the Charles River. So they have a, a city splash every year where you can do that. So it, it's nice to think about the history, but then about how it, it has become, or it remains a, a natural resource used for recreation. And that's inter interesting because a lot of people today, when they think of the Charles River, either think of the Charles River Basin in downtown Boston and, and Cambridge, or they think of maybe the few miles upstream from there with the bike paths on either side going up through Watertown and, and Waltham. And people don't think as much, I don't think, about the the industrial history of the Charles. And Newton Lower Mills or Lower Falls is certainly a a big example of that chapter in the Charles River's history that uh, most modern observers don't even think of. That's true. And in Newton, there were three spots with factories. One was, as you mentioned, Newton Lower Falls. Newton Upper Falls had a lot of factories. And then right at the Watertown border in the area of Newton called Nonantum was a whole nother set of factories. And some of them were on the Watertown side of the river. The industry became less as you went further out of the city so that by the time you hit Natick, there isn't much of it. But there's still many dams along the way used for sawmills or grinding mills in the past. So the river has definitely been dammed up almost since the English settlers came. All right. So those are the three remaining events in the Crossing Borders series. So if somebody were to go to all those, and maybe if they were lucky enough to go to the first walking tour as well, what would they take away from the whole series? I think they'd get a sense of how the development happened in all the towns and in the region. So the native story is well represented. That is who settled in this area first and how they used some of the natural resources and some of that interplay with the first settlers and with John Eliot trying to convert them. And then how the waterway shaped the towns in the Charles River talk, because so much of not only the border, but the definition of each town is the river is part of that. And then the suburbanization of the region with the transportation is covered in one of the talks. So you're really moving through time in different stages of history in the whole region. So if our listeners want to find out more about any of these events, or if they want to register to plan to go to these events, where should they look for more information? So we do have that posted in our own website. That's historicnewton.org. That's all one word, historicnewton, no space, dot O-R-G. And then each of the other historical societies, Wellesley Historical Society, dot O-R-G, Needham History, dot O-R-G, and Natick Historical Society, dot O-R-G. Every one of us has the information posted. So we'll make sure we link to those uh, organizations in the show notes today. Mm -hmm. And if our listeners wanted to keep up with uh, Historic Newton News, is there a place to follow the organization online? Right. So I, I did mention our website, historicnewton.org. But I also want to mention we have a Facebook account, we have Twitter, and Instagram, Historic Newton MA. So you can follow us on any of those. 
All right, Clara Silverstein, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. I just want to say thanks for joining us. Happy to do it. Thank you for having me. And now it's time for this week's main topic. Billy Tudor was born into tumultuous times. He graduated from Harvard in 1769 at age 19 and began studying law with an up-and-coming attorney named John Adams. He was thrust into the spotlight almost immediately. When Adams defended the soldiers accused in the Boston Massacre in 1770, Tudor served as one of his law clerks. Billy followed Adams both into the law and into support of the Massachusetts Whig cause that would soon spark the revolution. By the time Tudor was sworn into the Massachusetts bar as an attorney in his own right in 1772, Billy Tudor was an ardent patriot. John Adams had a high opinion of Billy, as he expressed in a letter to the young man's father in 1774, as Billy was trying to establish his law practice. I am well aware of the follies and vices so fashionable among many of the young gentlemen of our age and country, and if your son was infected with them, would never have become an advocate for him. But I know him to have a clear head and an honest, faithful heart. He is virtuous, sober, steady, industrious, and constant to his office. The two men remained friends for life, and much of their correspondence back and forth is available to read online in the collection of the Massachusetts Historical Society. One of those letters was written by Billy on April 5, 1775. It shows where the young lawyer's sympathies lay during the economic hardship of the Boston Port Act, and with the outbreak of war at Lexington and Concord just two weeks away. The women are terrified by the fears of blood and carnage. The merchants are dispirited. They now begin to think England can do more easily without us than we at first thought. What cowards does interest make men? Thank God our salvation is not dependent on the virtues of merchants. If it was, our perdition would be unavoidable. Americans may now show whether they deserve freedom by discovering resolution and to prefer poverty to slavery. When William Billy Tudor's grandson, also named William Tudor, edited the collected papers of William Sr.'s father, Deacon John Tudor, he included biographical information on his grandfather, Billy. One of the anecdotes he told was how Billy escaped from Boston as the British regulars put it under martial law and the patriots laid siege to the town. Open warfare was, however, too much for the young patriot lawyer, and soon after the siege of the town was begun by the provincials and before all the boats had been seized by General Gage, he managed to escape by way of Point Shirley to the provincial lines, where he joined the besieging army at Cambridge on the 12th of May, 1775. Another passage in the same chapter explains why Billy had tarried in Boston for almost a month after the siege began, until it was almost impossible for him to make his escape. Billy Tudor was head over heels in love with a young woman named Delia Jarvis. There was only one problem. Delia and her family were Tories supporters of the colony's royal government, and Delia's father was deeply protective of her. Many years later, Delia's grandson, Robert McWade, would write, Boston was much of a seafaring town in those days, and her father, Mr. Jarvis, was so careful of her that she was not permitted to even look out of the window on certain occasions, lest she should see a drunken man or brawl. The Jarvis family were such loyalists that they even continued to serve tea. McWade wrote, When the inhabitants were forbidden to use tea in Boston, and it was dangerous to do so, she regarded it as an invasion of her personal rights and got some tea by hook or crook and openly gave a tea party. Tea, of course, was considered an evil weed by Massachusetts patriots since the most famous tea party of all was carried out in 1773. But even before that, it had a strong symbolism. An August 1768 editorial in the Boston Gazette and Country Journal begged American families to stop drinking tea as a protest against the hated Townsend Acts. Let us abjure the poisonous, baneful plant and its odious infusion. Poisonous and odious, I mean, not on account of its physical qualities, but on account of the political diseases and death that are connected with every particle of it. In telling the story of his grandparents' unlikely romance, grandson William Tudor described Delia as... A Tory maiden who was so far from any sympathy for her own country that her family still continued to use the tabooed tea, the selling and buying of which was considered then little better than a crime in the town of Boston. 
This young woman, Delia Jarvis, is even said to have given the forbidden drink to the British troops returning exhausted from the Lexington skirmish. So, while Delia was providing succor to the troops returning from Lexington and Concord, Billy was scheming about how to escape from them. After he joined the rebel camp in Cambridge in May, Billy Tudor would eventually be appointed as the first Judge Advocate General of the Continental Army after George Washington took charge in July of 1775. Before Washington arrived, however, the raw Patriot troops would face one of the bloodiest pitched battles of the war. From his letter to John Adams written a few days later, it doesn't sound like Tudor participated in the fighting at Bunker Hill, but he was no stranger to the cost of war. You will doubtless, before the receipt of this letter, have heard of the bloody engagement at Charlestown. The ministerial troops gained the hill, but were victorious losers. A few more such victories, and they are undone. The loss of Dr. Warren is irreparable. His death is generally and greatly lamented. But dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. This is the day of heroes. The fall of one will inspire the surviving glorious band to emulate his virtues and revenge his death on the foes of liberty and our country. Meanwhile, Delia was still inside Boston, and she saw the cost of Bunker Hill from the other side, as she once again served tea to the British troops as they returned from battle. The anxiety and various emotions of the people of Boston on this occasion had a highly dramatic kind of interest. Those who sided with the British troops began to see, even in the duration of this battle, the possibility that they had taken the wrong side, and that they might become exiles from their country while those whose whole soul was with their countrymen were in a dreadful apprehension for their friends in a contest the severity of which was shown by the destruction of so many of their enemies. After the battle had continued for some time, a young person living in Boston possessed a very keen and generous feelings, bordering perhaps a little on the romantic, as was natural to her age, sex, and lively imagination, finding that many of the wounded troops brought over from the field of action were carried by her residents mixed a quantity of refreshing beverage, and with a female domestic by her side, stood at the door and offered it to the sufferers as they were borne along, burning with fever and parched with thirst. Several of them, grateful for the kindness, gave her, as they thought, consolation, by assuring her of the destruction of her countrymen. One young officer said, Never mind it, my brave young lady, we have peppered them well, depend on it. Her dearest feelings, deeply interested in the opposite camp, were thus unintentionally lacerated while she was pouring oil and wine into their wounds. That's from a biography of James Otis, written by Delia and Billy's son, also named William Tudor, that was published in 1823. Compared to the younger William Tudor's notes in Deacon Tudor's diary, which was published over 70 years later, William Jr.'s book is a lot more circumspect about Delia's support of the Tory cause. He notes that her feelings were lacerated, and one might infer that she was a supporter of the Patriot cause, while those in the know understood that she was likely just worried about the fate of her Billy. Local historian J.L. Bell notes, He eventually won his bride over to his political side, the family said, but the couple's son hadn't suggested any split loyalties for her in 1823 when public feelings about the loyalists might still have been raw. Now Delia and Billy were trapped on opposite sides of an increasingly bloody war, with entrenched armies on either side keeping close watch on the other. If they had been caught meeting, nobody would have believed that their motives were innocent, and they would have faced imprisonment or worse. But, to paraphrase Jurassic Park, love will find a way. Grandson William describes how the young lovers managed to continue seeing each other in his notes on Deacon Tudor's diary. He found, however, a curious means of visiting the woman of his choice, who had now moved to Noddle Island, East Boston, probably because the city was not only uncomfortable on account of the many troops, but besides a dangerous residence. Like another Leander, William Tudor swam across from the mainland to the island, carrying his clothes on his head, and returned in the same way after his visit. He was always a fine swimmer and diver, and when a boy, is reported to have jumped from the bowsprit end of a frigate, whence none of the officers dared to follow him. 
Perhaps it was this demonstration of devotion that convinced Delia to accept Billy's marriage proposal. Their engagement, however, would not be a cakewalk. Robert McQuaid noted, On account of the Revolutionary War, the engagement between my grandparents lasted seven years. After the evacuation of Boston, the Continental Army moved south, and Billy moved with them. The couple would face years-long absences that kept them separated by hundreds of miles, and they faced conflicting loyalties. Not only that, but they faced the disapproval of Delia's protective father, who no doubt saw Billy at first as a worthless traitor. After Daddy forbade Delia from continuing the romance, Billy wrote in 1776, Am I only what I was in that first charming hour, an acquaintance and a friend? Her response must have cut poor Billy like a knife. I have no virtues. You only cheat yourself to apologize for a blind partiality of which you have cause indeed to blush at when it debases the dignity of your character so much as to court my love after a prohibition. I write with plainness prompted by the sincerest friendship. Your friend, Felicia. However, Billy remained undeterred. In spite of all the obstacles, he maintained his faith in the Patriot cause while also keeping his love for Delia alive. His firmness in the cause was on display in a letter he wrote to Delia on December 24, 1776, the night before he accompanied Washington on his famous crossing of the Delaware. My hopes of soon returning to Boston are vanished. I cannot desert a man who has deserted everything to defend his country and whose chief misfortune among 10,000 others is that a large part of it wants spirit to defend itself. I have not yet ceased to love my country. Do all the young geniuses of Boston still dream and trade on? And are we still to look to every other place but that, for liberal souls and intrepid spirits at a time when our bleeding, ravaged, half-conquered country calls for every exertion? I often blush for my native town. Again, love will find a way. Their grandson Robert McWade noted how their ardor transformed opposing political convictions into playful banter. My grandfather William Tudor was a revolutionary soldier and used to write to my grandmother from the battlefields as my fair loyalist, as she was opposed to the war, and subscribe himself at the close as your ever faithful rebel. Later, however, she espoused the cause of the faithful rebel. Eventually, love did find a way. Delia accepted Billy's proposal, and the couple was married in Boston on March 5th, 1778. By this time, of course, William Tudor was too respectable to be known as Billy anymore. He resigned from the army on April 9th of the same year and worked to reestablish a legal practice in Boston, then entered state politics. Over the years, he served in the state house and senate and eventually as secretary of the Commonwealth. Selfishly, we're grateful that he put his interest in history to work in co-founding the Massachusetts Historical Society, the first meeting of which was held in his living room. After a colorful life and distinguished career, William Tudor died in 1819. Delia Jarvis Tudor lived to be 91, old enough to attend the dedication of the Bunker Hill Monument in 1843, commemorating the battle that had so badly split her allegiances. Her grandson, Robert McWade, interviewed her extensively for the family history portion of his biography of Charles Stewart, describing her in later years as... She was a sprightly, beautiful, and highly accomplished woman. She wrote poetry with facility and was a skillful musician and a lovely singer. At the age of 90, she still sang sweetly. She was a delightful conversationalist, full of intelligence, anecdote, and wit, with a wonderful memory. Six of the happy couple's eight children lived to adulthood. Their eldest, William Jr., co-founded the Boston Athenaeum, a private library that's now a historic institution almost as important as the Massachusetts Historical Society. He also co-founded the magazine North American Review, and he wrote several books, including the biography of James Otis that we quoted from above. A daughter named Delia would marry a naval officer named Charles Stewart, who became famous as the captain who commanded the USS Constitution during its most dramatic victories in the War of 1812. Delia and Charles were the parents of Robert McWade, whose biography of Charles Stewart we quoted above. The most famous of the bunch was Frederick, who became known as the Ice King after the company he founded began shipping ice cut from New England ponds to refrigerate produce in Cuba, India, 
and around the American South. Frederick had a son who was also named William Tudor, who edited the volume Deacon Tudor's Diary that we quoted from extensively. The unlikely love of Billy Tudor and Delia Jarvis not only survived their starting out on opposite sides of a war, but created a dynasty that had great influence over the early literary, military, and economic affairs of the republic that they helped found. To learn more about Delia and Billy's romance, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 131. We'll have links to the books by Robert McWade and both Williams Tudor that we quoted from so extensively. We'll also link to a selection of correspondence between the first William Tudor and his mentor, John Adams as well as one of the letters William wrote to Delia while he was serving in the Continental Army. Just for good measure, we'll link to that 1768 editorial on the evils of tea as well. And of course, we'll have links to information about our upcoming event and Bunker Hill, a city, a siege, a revolution. This week's Boston Book Club pick. If you want to leave us some feedback, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. You can call and leave a voicemail at 617-383-9255, and we might play it on the show. We're Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. While you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. We're in all your favorite podcasting apps, including Google Podcasts and Google Play Music, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, TuneIn Radio, Player FM, and many more apps. Stream the show every Sunday night at 8 p.m. on bostonfreeradio.com. You can also listen on your favorite smart speaker. If you have an Amazon Echo, just say, Alexa, play the Hub History podcast. Or if you have a Google Home, you can say, Hey Google, play the Hub History podcast. Sure, playing the latest episode of Hub History, our favorite stories from Boston history. Apple Podcasts is still the most popular podcast app. If you subscribe on Apple, please consider rating and reviewing us. It helps us show up higher in the podcast rankings where people can find us more easily. If you write us a review, drop us a line and we'll send you a Hub History sticker as a token of our appreciation. Or just tell a friend about us. Word of mouth is truly the best way to help new listeners discover the show. That's all for now. We'll be back next time to talk about the 1745 assault by Massachusetts troops on the strongest French fortress in North America.